from A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux. The Fremen Mirage, Part 3b, Myths of the Atreides. This is Part 3b of our four and three quarters part series on what we're calling the Fremen Mirage. Last week, we traced the origins of this idea in the Greek and Roman ethnographic tradition. We found that the tropes that make up this concept, the poor, unsophisticated, but morally pure and militarily powerful Fremen and their decadent, civilized adversaries, actually had precious little to do with describing ancient, non-state cultures. Instead, the Fremen mirage emerged in these works mostly through self-definition and criticism. The mirage was never about accurately characterizing the Fremen, but building self-identity or practicing self-criticism among the settled, literate society. Consequently, descriptions of ancient non-state peoples were bent and molded to fit the trope, rather than the other way around, frequently by authors like Tacitus, who often had little to no direct contact with these cultures. And then, the tradition sleeps. Tacitus's Germania is effectively lost until 1425, though at least one monk seems to have used it as a source in the 9th century. Rudolf of Fulda, see Krebs, 2012. Herodotus and the rest of the Greek language ethnographic tradition, Strabo, Diodorus, Dionysus, etc., etc., are also less influential for the Middle Ages in Europe, especially Western Europe as well. Many of these works remained in greater circulation in the Muslim world, but, as we'll see towards the end of this post, Muslim writers had their own theories about the advantages of non-state peoples, and had little need for classical Greek expertise on horse-born nomads, frequently being descendants of some and opponents of others themselves. Instead, medieval efforts to mythologize the historical past often focused on placing a people or a ruler within the lens of what Brett Whalen calls sacred or providential time, understanding them in the context of the broader Christian religious project. The history or myth-making, the line between the two, as we'll see, can be quite blurry, thus sought to resolve problems like the pre-Christian past of now Christian kingdoms, which might be resolved, for instance, by the sainted founder-converter-ruler or by an assertion of a sort of pre-Christian proto-piety. Alternately, a community might seek to legitimize itself by connecting to classical antiquity. Snorri Storlson, for instance, seats the origins of Norse mythology and people in survivors of the Trojan War. Why not? Likewise, Geoffrey of Monmouth, 1095 to 1155, has his Britons descent from a mythical Trojan Brutus, grandson of Ascanius, son of Aeneas. Carrie E. Benes, Urban Legends, Civic Identity and the Classical Past in Northern Italy, 1250 to 1350, 2011, notes Italian communes might try to remember or invent claims either linked to or of greater antiquity than those of Rome itself. Solace's model of decline and Caesar's writings both remained popular in the Middle Ages as tools for training rulers. They might also help in those projects, but the idea of the Fremen Mirage is not a key part of that. Instead, if anything, medieval literature is in part, focus not on the need for hard, barbarian warriors to solve problems, but on the pressing need to Christianize, and thus control and civilize such individuals, for example, the Normans. If anything, medieval Christian authors, rather than looking for some good men to do some violence, seem focused on the, not unreasonable, idea that their society was overrun with violence that needed to be restrained. I am generalizing, of course, there are exceptions. Bertrand de Born, roughly 1140 to 1215, would like to do some war, for instance. But still, this is hardly fertile ground to revisit ancient pagan warriors with the mirage. Contrast Beowulf's treatment of its main character's paganism as sharply tragic, for instance. Instead, this particular trope picks up again in the early modern period, lurking among the intellectuals of Europe from the 16th to the 18th century, 
before exploding into the popular consciousness and popular literature in the worst possible form in the 19th century. Let's look at how that happens and how it reshapes the classical tradition into a new form. Note, there's a lot of book name checking here because, as I note below, classical reception is not my field, narrowly speaking, nor do I specialize in medieval or modern historiography or linguistics. In addition to the books I note here, I want to extend a thanks to my colleagues Daniel W. Morgan and Catherine O'Neill, who kindly offered to help me make less of a fool of myself. All errors remain, of course, mine. Imagining Tacitus The Europe into which Tacitus's Germania re-emerges was very different from the one it had left, and was undergoing rapid changes besides. I should note that the narrative of the reception of the Germania that follows is not mine. Classical reception is its own field, with its own specialists, but borrows heavily from C.B. Krebs' A Most Dangerous Book, 2012. Tacitus's work was rediscovered in 1425, although there are some hints that it had been used, plagiarized, really, by Rudolf of Fulda in roughly 865, and took a while to filter into the broader intellectual consciousness. Meanwhile, as Benedict Anderson has famously noted in Imagined Communities, 1983, the mass communication enabled by expanding literacy and especially the printing press, would begin through the 15th and 16th centuries to create a nascent sense of nationhood and nationalism in parts of Europe. I do not want to get into the weeds of that process. It is complex, regionally varied, quite contested, and tremendous in its import. But it is essential to know that it is happening in the background, as the modern form of the Fremen Mirage is being forged. But in Germany, the process of creating that imagined community was particularly difficult. For much of the early modern period, the best intellectual currency in Europe was a connection to the Greek and Roman past. Rulers could mobilize Greek and Roman imagery to legitimize themselves, and Greek and Roman learning remained the foundation for humanistic study of basically everything. But for German speakers, it is still far too early to speak of Germans more broadly Therein lay a problem. Unlike the Spanish, or French, or Italians, or even the English, the core German-speaking territories of the Holy Roman Empire, the place that might be understood as Germany, had never been part of the Roman Empire. The one connection it had with that edifice was through the Catholic Church, and by 1525, Germany such as it was would be violently split over movements to cut that tie as well. As Krebs so neatly shows, Tacitus and his image of the Germans, simple, uneducated, but tough, morally pure, and unmixed, and thus ethnically pure, filled the void, providing part of the foundation for a narrative that both defined Germanness, especially against Italians, handy, when you are having the Protestant Reformation, and set forth a positive story for the origin of a German people, which contrasted them favorably with the Romans. One of the most important assertions was that Tacitus's Germans had never been conquered. This would have required at least some mental gymnastics for understanding Charlemagne as essentially German, but see below on the Franchi, a note we'll return to in a moment. It mattered little, of course, that Tacitus had never been to Germany, did not speak any Germanic language, and mostly constructed his account as a morality tale meant for Romans about Roman society. It also mattered little that the connection between Tacitus's Germani and the German speakers of the 16th century was, as a matter of ancestry, strained at best. Likewise, Early modern readers of Tacitus were quite gullible when it came to his claims that the Germans were solidly beyond the Roman world. Roman trade goods had penetrated into Germany even by Tacitus's day. But none of that mattered. Tacitus filled an emotional and intellectual need. That meant that Tacitus's Fremen stereotypes of the other were steadily 
adopted as national mythology for an emerging notion of the German people, defining them in certain ways and professing a, again, deeply strained history of the Germans as a pure, unmixed people, delivered supposedly pristine and untouched from their classical Fremen past. But Tacitus's Germans weren't the only ones to receive this treatment. Celts, here, there, and everywhere. The Fremen turn in France and the British Isles emerges a bit later, but has many of the same contours because the Romans applied the same descriptive template to many of their non-state barbarian neighbors regardless of local institutions, which is why Caesar's Belgae and Helvetiae sound so much like Tacitus's Germans. What follows will be a fairly brief summary, but for a fuller account of both continental and insular claims to Celtic identity, and the insurmountable problems and claims to a single pan-European Celtic identity, see Simon James's The Atlantic Celts, Ancient People or Modern Invention, 1999. As a necessary aside, some of this is going to depend on linguistics. I am not a language specialist, though I read a few languages, much less a Celtic language specialist, of which I read none. I am giving my best understanding of these relationships based on what I have read. Also, a terminology clarification. Some of you have noticed that I tend to studiously avoid using the word Celtic to describe anything that isn't a language or language family. You are about to discover why. But to set out how I generally use the terminology, Celtic refers exclusively to language groups. For example, Celtic languages, Celtic language speakers. Yes, the term goes back to Greek sources who called some of these folks Keltoi. It's unclear if any of them ever called themselves that. But as we'll see, it becomes hopelessly muddled in the modern period, except as a linguistic term. Gaelic refers to a group of apparently culturally related, but not necessarily genetically related, people, as understood by the Romans, clustered around the Alps. Latin material culture refers to a set of archaeologically recognizable signifiers, objects, art styles, settlement patterns, which are, in some cases, associated with people who are known to have been Gaelic or Celtic language speaking, and in some cases not. There are certain situations where I might say a site has Latin material culture, and I may suspect it was inhabited by Gauls, who I may suspect were Celtic language speakers. But as we'll see below, those things are not certain in many cases. In other cases, Ireland, for instance, we have Celtic language speakers who are very definitely not Gauls, while in Spain we have Celtic language speakers who might well be related to Gauls, but lack some notable elements of Latin material culture. While meanwhile, in Anatolia, we have a Gaelic people with Latin material culture who, while speaking a Celtic language, write in Greek. History is funny that way, and it's always best to be cautious. The idea of a pan-Celtic identity had been bouncing around since at least George Buchanan's work in 1582, but it really caught fire with the linguistic work of Edward Lude in 1707. Much like with the German fascination with the Germania, which, for its flaws, was an authentic ancient source, albeit one that needed to be read far more critically, the Atlantic Celts begin with a grain of truth. Lude demonstrated that Scottish Gaelic Irish and Manx were all related to each other, with a common ancestor language sometimes called Q-Celtic. This had been long suspected, and related more distantly to Cornish and Welsh, but also Breton, the language of Brittany in France, sometimes thought to collectively descend from a common ancestor, P-Celtic. These languages, then, seem to have been in the same general language family as the long-dead languages spoken in Gaul, Noricum, and parts of Spain prior to the Roman conquest, after which they were slowly displaced by Latin. Image. Celtic language family tree. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A chart of Celtic languages as they are thought to relate to each other. 
Languages in red do not survive. End of image description. That linguistic link, so far as I am able to tell, is well demonstrated and now considered soundly proved, with alterations as you might imagine. But the conclusions that were swiftly drawn from it were anything but sound. Lud tentatively imagined that Britain might have been populated by an invasion wave of prehistoric migration. The medieval histories of both Ireland and Great Britain had recorded their history as a series of invasions, but the archaeological evidence seems to argue against this being the case. He collectively called these fellows Celts rather than Gauls because the term Gaelic was associated with France and Britain. And British pride in 1707 would hardly stand the suggestion that they were, in fact, transplanted Frenchmen, though it is worth noting that it is practically certain no one anywhere in the British Isles would have called themselves Celtic or Gaelic prior to the Roman arrival. Though naturally, the sudden vogue for anything Celtic would extend to France, where one of the key debates in the salons of the 1700s was if the French should be understood as fundamentally German, descending from the Germanic Franchi, or fundamentally Gaelic. Montesquieu, for instance, favored the Germanic origin, Nationalism would resolve the issue in the French consciousness. As Germany rose as a threat to France, the Gaelic identity became paramount, with figures like Vercingetorix transformed into national heroes. Note also in this tradition, as a symbol of resistance against the Germans, everyone's favorite French comic, Asterix les Gaulois. As James notes, the 18th century saw a hunger in many parts of Britain, newly so unified in that same year, 1707, among the non-English, for an ethnic identity with antiquity that could compete with the claims of other such identities. Indeed, Lud himself knew what he was doing. He was part of the conversation with figures like Paul Yavis Pezron, 1639, 1706, who posited a Celtic origin for the Spartans and that the Celte descended from Noah, no, really, through Japhet, and were the original titans of Greek myth. Demonstrating the unified Celtic language family served as part of a project of discovering, or manufacturing, a suitably ancient and august origin, which should stand proud against the English and their Anglo-Saxon heritage. If that seems crazy, I should note that German-speaking intellectuals were trading in similar theories about the Germanic peoples of Tacitus. That Tuisto, Tacitus' German founder deity, was in fact a son of Noah, or could be dated relative to the Trojan War, or even established an unbreakable line of German kings down to the then present. Note one of the core assumptions here, that a people, or culture, or race share a family tree with a common ancestor or point of origin. That assumption is largely wrong, by the by. Humans intermix and intermarry a lot, but it is going to inform some concentrated ugliness in just a few paragraphs. Image. Map of Hallstatt and Latin material culture. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A map of the Hallstatt and Latin material culture zones. Yellow indicates areas of Hallstatt material culture, roughly 800 BC, an earlier artifact set associated with Gaelic peoples. The other colors indicate expanding zones of Latin material culture in stages. Note that, especially in the British Isles and Spain, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies with how Latin material culture looks on the ground, and also we occasionally find Latin objects way outside the Latin culture zone. End of image description. This vision was then compounded by the emerging discipline of archaeology. In 1857, the lowering water level at the Lake of Latin, a small town in the Swiss Alps, exposed a wealth of Gaelic artifacts. From what Caesar tells us, we might expect the Helvetii to have lived here. Pro-Celtic European scholars were quick to connect the material culture type, that is, the object and art styles, what I refer to as Latin material culture, with an expanding zone of Celtic peoples, brought about by migration and invasion. Nationalist imaginings flourished over the idea of Celtic warlord conquistadors spreading out over Europe, 
a Fremen invasion of hardened barbarian warriors. Note that there are two huge assumptions there. First is that the objects, which we can observe, can be taken to clearly indicate a culture, which we cannot observe. And that second, the expansion of the culture was assumed to have been the product of the migration of people. That is, the assumption was that a single genetically Celtic stock of people was expanding across Europe. And let me be clear, both of those assumptions are quite bad. Image, side by side of Latin and Roman helmets. Image description, left, Montefortino Latin helmet, 4th century BCE. Right, Roman Montefortino helmet, 220 to 170 BCE. The original helmet would have had cheek guards much like the one on the left. And if you were thinking, well, those are practically the same sort of helmet, yeah. We can actually tell the difference between Roman and Gaelic Montefortino helmets fairly well. Difference in materials, manufacture, and decoration. But this can illustrate how these objects can move without the movement of any people. The Romans adopt a lot of Gaelic military material culture. Here, the Romans have adopted a Gaelic helmet and started making it locally with minor differences in style because the Romans aren't quite as good at metalworking as the Gauls. End of image description. For instance, while continental Latin material culture made it to southern Britain, and Caesar is clear that some social institutions followed, it's now quite clear that there was no invasion of Gaelic peoples, but simple cultural exchange over an active trade zone. Part of how we can tell is burial customs. An invading people will naturally bring their own burial customs with them, but the arrival of Latin material culture doesn't disrupt burial customs in southern England, which were different than those on the continent. But the arrival of Latin material culture doesn't disrupt the burial customs in southern England, which were different than those on the continent, at all. Instead, we get British burials with continental goods, strongly indicating that the pre-Roman British elites are importing Latin goods, and maybe even some ideas and institutions, but not large numbers of continental people. Likewise, Latin material culture rushes into sites in Thrace that we know from our ancient sources are Thracian-speaking and culturally Thracian, not Celtic in any way. Hell, if we went by material culture alone, we might identify some Roman military sites as Celtic, since the Romans adopted the Gaelic shield, helmet, and body armor. The same problems, as a side note, play out in Spain. Check out Fernando Casada Sanz's excellent work on military material culture in pre-Roman Spain. For example, Weapons, Warriors, and Battles of Ancient Iberia, 2017. Alas, Casada Sanz's most thorough stuff on this is, understandably, in Spanish. But even if you only read English, you may rest assured that a whole lot of expertise sits behind his conclusions. His El Armamento Iberico, 1997, is truly impressive. There's some Latin stuff in Spain, but also local variants we don't see anywhere else, including, maybe, the ancestor of the Roman Gladius, and some cross-pollination with local Iberian, non-Latin equipment. It really is quite fascinating stuff, but obvious evidence of some grand Celtic invasion of most of Europe, it is not. More likely, in many cases, pretty things and effective weapons were adopted by whoever lived there, including the Romans, and, by the by, the Greeks, who picked up the Gaelic shield, probably from the Galatians, named it the Thudius, and made quite a bit of use of it. Of course, in some cases, we do know about large-scale migrations. The Galatians, a Gaelic, Celtic-language-speaking, Latin material culture people, migrated into Anatolia, for instance, and probably Hellenized their culture significantly, so becoming quite culturally distinct in their own right. They start writing in Greek. Likewise, it seems like there is some in-migration of Celtic language speakers into Spain, but also lots of cultural fusion and exchange. What I want to note here is that 
Even these migrations do not establish that all, most, or even basically any of these Latin material culture peoples had some kind of common ancestry, which, as we'll see, is a real sticking point. In fact, Caesar's own description of Gaul implies the opposite. All of the three groups he notes, the Gaeli, Belge, and Aquitani, have Latin material culture. Yet even Caesar can clearly see they are distinct cultural ethnic groupings which have adopted a shared material culture, and he only considers one of these groups strictly Gaelic, though they are likely all Celtic language speakers. I do not want to get too into the weeds on Latin material culture archaeology or its implications, at least not right now. Rather, the key point here is that by the start of the 19th century, and especially after 1857, French, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and even, oddly, English, at times when asserting Anglo-Saxon Germanness was inconvenient, the English often fell back on the Arthurian mythos and a Romano-British Celtic nationalism had been caught up with the idea of the supposedly Celtic proto-nation, expanding bands of genetically linked conquering warriors, bringing their culture and objects with them. This view, I want to stress, is not supported by the current evidence. Consequently, several of the key national myths, and here I do mean myths, remember, most of this is rubbish, hinged on an idealized past of heroic, barbaric warriors whose lack of sophistication bred moral purity and ruthless military success. Remember that the bad assumptions being made by assuming both the Germans and Celts are invading and displacing all sorts of people while maintaining genetic purity, meaning lots of very successful genocidal warfare. The Fremen Mirage, which had been a way for ancient authors to analyze or critique their own typically non-Fremen societies, had re-emerged as a tool for national self-identification. In the case of the Insular Celts, that mostly meant Irish, Welsh, Scottish, Cornish, and Manx, rallying around an identity that excluded their English overlords. But, see below. Image. Engraving of Boudicca haranguing the Britons. Image description. An engraving, published 1793, of a painting by John Opie, 1761 to 1807, a Cornish painter of Boudicca, unknown to 60, the Queen of the Iceni, a tribe of Celtic language speakers destroyed by the Romans. As a Celtic-speaking leader who resisted foreign invasion, Boudicca was a useful symbol for the non-English nationalisms in the Isles, who might regard the Anglo-Saxons, equal English, as foreign invaders. Boudicca is an interesting figure in this regard because her legacy is co-opted by the English during the Victorian period, with greater intensity as Great Britain increasingly aligned away from Germany. Nevertheless, in 1793, Boudicca was more likely to be a Celtic than an English symbol. Note also that none of the clothing here is correct to the first century, but instead, especially Boudicca's dress, fits Regency fashion, 1795 to 1820, which aimed to imitate classical styles very loosely. End of image description. But if, as I keep noting, these theories about expanding warrior peoples displacing their neighbors have been pretty well demolished, why does this idea survive so strongly in the popular culture? Romantic Racism So far, our revived Fremen Mirage has primarily lived among the intelligentsia of Europe, an idea with currency among the sort of people whose nascent nationalism also followed with an interest in classical ethnography or linguistics. It was a creature of the elite salons and for much of the 18th century played second fiddle to enlightenment thought, which was more interested in a universal science of government than peculiar local institutions, and saw its roots in classical antiquity rather than the pre-Roman past. 
As the 1700s closed, however, the Enlightenment largely gave way to a new intellectual movement, Romanticism. Romanticism focused on individual emotion rather than the impersonal reason of the Enlightenment, and had a love of the medieval and pre-Roman pasts, which were conceived of as heroic, emotional, and anti-rational in contrast to the rationalism of the classics. The roots of Romanticism seem to lie in Germany with the Sturm und Drang movement of the late 1700s, but the French Revolution and the perceived failure of its Enlightenment values, with the Universalist creeds of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, giving way to the emotive nationalism of Napoleon and the Levy en masse, seems to have impelled Romanticism to the fore, while resistance against Napoleon provided the fuel for nationalism in the states that opposed him. And it seems to have repopularized the Fremen Mirage. The Mirage fits beautifully with the zeitgeist of Romanticism. Incidentally, zeitgeist itself was a term coined in this period. It imagined raw, larger-than-life, heroic ancestors, Arminius, Boudicca, Vercingetorix, and a morally pure, independent past, free from either outside influence or the corrupting role of modernity, fitting with the philosophy of Rousseau that modern society was essentially corrupting of the originally pure man. It fit with a rush to rediscover, record, or in some cases fabricate folklore and traditional stories as a way of recapturing an authentic past. It was an age for national epics, the rediscovery and translation of Beowulf, first printed edition, 1815. English Romantic nationalism would remain, for most of the 19th century, focused on Germanic Anglo-Saxon ancestry until the World Wars turned the Brother German into the Hun, with a consequent renewed focus by the English in sharing with Britain's Celtic past. Ironically, as Simon James notes, a past that had previously been used to marginalize and belittle Britain's own Celtic language speakers, or Wagner's famous adaptation of the German Nibelungenlied as Der Ring des Nibelungen, these were romantic nationalist projects. Image, sculpture of Boudicca. Image description. Boudicca again, this time sculpted by Thomas Thornycroft, 1815 to 1885, an English sculptor, erected in London. The figure of Boudicca is made at least partially in the likeness of Queen Victoria. The statue was finished in 1883 and erected in 1902, by which time, Tensions with Germany had led many of the English to identify more strongly with a Celtic pre-Roman ancestry than a Germanic Anglo-Saxon heritage. Boudicca, refashioned as a British warrior queen, made a perfect stand-in for Victoria and the British Empire. A vivid example of how a single historical figure can be mythologized and repurposed many different ways. End of image description. Krebs associates this in Germany with the work of Friedrich Kohlrausch. No, not that Friedrich Kohlrausch, this Friedrich Kohlrausch, 1780-1867, whose Die Duschte Geschichte für Schule und Haus, The German History for School and Home, 1816, went through more than a dozen editions and set the mold for education in the 19th century in many of the German states, though he is far from the only one. An unabashed nationalist, Kohlrausch saw a single German Volk originating from the Germani of Tacitus and extending down to his present, with a constant set of virtues as laid out by Tacitus. Virtues, it must be stressed, Tacitus is making up, as he never went anywhere near German-speaking lands. Indeed, he termed Tacitus, Krebs' translation, quote, a mirror of honor and pride as well as imitation, end quote, and, quote, a temple of honor, to the German nation, end quote. That there was no German nation in Tacitus' day, but many non-state and proto-state polities of German speakers mattered little. I offer Kohlrausch not as the grand origin point of the movement, he was not, but as a representative of its scope and aims. 
If that was the whole of the weave of our 19th century version of the Mirage, it would not be uncommonly bad as such national myths go. Silly, outdated, and uncritical, but a little different than Geoffrey of Monmouth's Trojan Britons. Court historians had been telling myths disguised as history to consolidate state power for as long as there had been court historians. But a weave has two parts. Romantic nationalism is the weft. 19th century scientific racism. There are not enough sneer quotes in the whole of the English language for the word scientific there is the warp. And as both Simon James, speaking of both Anglo-Saxon and Celtic mythmaking, and Krebs, speaking of Germanic mythmaking, make abundantly clear, the weave here was tight, functionally inseparable. Racism was not new to the 19th century, but the idea that it ought to be approached scientifically as the product of immutable characteristics was. I will not rehearse the whole nasty history of the world historically awful idea, but except to note that at the time it was commonly assumed that there were identifiable races, that these shared common, immutable, genetic characteristics, and that the mixing of these races must necessarily diminish them. That last bit in particular, the contribution of Arthur de Gobineau, will be relevant in a moment. Scientific racists imagined a perverse hierarchy of people. We, in America, tend to imagine this sort of racism as a white, non-white thing, but there were also assumed gradations between various European groups, with Mediterranean and Eastern Europeans shoved down, and the many non-European peoples in their colonies pushed yet lower still. And just so we're clear, all of this was 110% non-scientific, industrial-grade, garbage thinking. However, it was the dominant thinking of the time, and fit neatly with the romantic nationalist vision of the past. If national greatness was found in the genes, it ought to appear not only in the present, but also in the past. Thus the idea that the Germans had never been conquered became an article of proof of German genetic superiority for scientific races. Tacitus's description, which again was never really very accurate, became a list of immutable characteristics of the German Volk. Take Kohlrausch. He also fixed on what is a quite minor detail in Tacitus's telling, that the Germani were, quote, not at all mixed with other peoples through immigration or hospitality, end quote. Tacitus, Germania, chapter 2, line 1. This, the people that resembles only itself, was, by Tacitus's day, a well-worn trope of ethnographic writing, a commonplace which might be assigned to any number of exotic peoples. But Kohlrausch and his contemporaries took it as uniquely true of the Germans, that they were racially unmixed. Again, to be clear, that is nonsense. An exoticizing trope the Greeks and Romans applied to any number of foreigners with limited accuracy at best. The Fremen Mirage became a trope deployed in the service of demonstrating racial purity and superiority. As Simon James notes, the Celtic versions of this idea, both the insular, that is, of the British Isles, and the continental, read France, versions, emerged in competition to German and Anglo-Saxon claims of racial superiority. Claims to unique Celtic identity in France and the British Isles also turned on questions of racial purity. The debate about the genetic legacy of the British Isles is ongoing and deeply tied into English, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, etc. identity. See, for instance, B. Sykes, Blood of the Isles, 2006, where modern genetic testing is employed in an effort to demonstrate the Celtic, but not Gaelic, ancestry of all 
of the inhabitants of the isles, including the English. I render no verdict on this debate or research. I'm not qualified to, except that as an American, I think common ancestry ain't worth squat. Image. Statue of Gaelic Cavalryman. Image description. Cavalier Gaulois. Gaelic Cavalryman. 1853. By Antoine Augustin Perrault. End of image description. Decadence Abroad. Of course, as we've detailed before, the mirror image of the Fremen Mirage is decadence. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the emphasis on emotion over reason inherent in Romanticism, decadence and moral decline were key points of interest. It is the theme which gives Shelley's Ozymandias, 1818, its great poignancy. The contrast between Ozymandias' hubris and the complete decline of his works. It is not an accident that the meme with which we began the series pulls most of its background images from romantic paintings. For instance, Thomas Cole's The Course of Empire, 1836, is a sequence of five paintings from raw, beautiful, undistributed wildlife to an idealized state to the consummation of empire showing decadence and then destruction and finally desolation. One can feel the influence of Edward Gibbon's The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 1789, with its thesis that Roman collapse was caused by moral decline and the rise of Christianity. Image. GIF of the five paintings of the course of empire. Image description. Assuming this works, you should see all five paintings from the course of empire, 1836. End of image description. Likewise, of course, Thomas Couture's famous Romans during the decadence, 1847. Image, the painting, Romans during the decadence. Image description, Thomas Couture's Romans during the decadence, 1847. End of image description. As Krebs notes, the connection between German fremenness and supposed genetic superiority and Roman decadence is made explicit by Kohlrausch's friend Ernst Moritz Arndt, who wrote a series of popular pamphlets on the purity of the German race, gleaned from Tacitus, contrasted with the degeneracy of Rome, which he attributes to intermarriage and racial mixing. Italy, Arndt says, translator Krebs, channeling the gendered aspect of decline, which is thought to effeminate its subjects, as we saw with Caesar, quote, had once been the mistress of the world, a bastardized canal, cursed and outcast, end quote. Rome, Arndt argued, fell because it intermarried and interbred. An argument, I'm quite sad to say, I still see today, often thinly veiled at best. It is raw, unfiltered nonsense, but that's a series for another day. But much of the decadence narrative was instead placed on the Near East and the Muslim world, as detailed perhaps most notably by Edward Said in Orientalism, 1978. My view on Said's work, particularly his treatment of the classical past, are complex, and I won't get into them here. On the present point, I think he is quite correct. Romantic artwork explodes with depictions of a sexualized, feminized, remember how decadence in Herodotus and Caesar makes the decadent men womanly? Yep, that's back. Exoticized Orient to contrast with the hard, productive, simple, manly West. Much of this mobilized the tropes of the Fremen Mirage, now filtered through an ideology of racial superiority to justify colonial exploitation. Image, Eugene Delacroix's The Death of Sardanapalus. Image description, Eugene Delacroix, The Death of Sardanapalus, 1827. An image set in the imagined collapse of the Assyrian Empire, roughly 600 BC, and a classic example of French Orientalist painting in the Romantic period. Mixing exoticism, sex, wealth, and violence to construct the decadent, collapsing civilization. End of image description. Almost 
all of this sort of artwork, which begins during the Romantic period and continues beyond it for much of the 19th century, it should be noted, was produced by artists who had never been to the East, and most certainly never inside of the palaces and particularly harems they depicted. Anyone, even remotely familiar with period dress in the Muslim world, recognizes these paintings for the absurdities they are. Actually, Lindsay Ellis touches on this quite effectively in a recent video about an orientalizing character in The Phantom of the Opera, which sums it up nicely. Nevertheless, these sorts of paintings became the image of a decadent East against which to understand the Fremen West. Exporting the Mirage Now I should be clear, this intellectual tradition of historical cycles of rises, declines, and falls is not the only one. The Chinese concept of the Mandate of Heaven has a similar cyclical implication to it as a dynasty rises, then loses the backing of divine forces and collapses, leading to the next. Medieval Europe actually had a similar concept, the Translatio Imperii, transfer of rule empire which was a way of viewing history as a series of successions from one group or dynasty to the next, typically with divine agency motivating the transfer of rule from less pious rulers to more pious ones. And I'm going to talk about Ibn Khaldun's ideas around Asabia and decline in just 94 words. So why focus on this intellectual tradition? Well, the answer is simply that while adherents to the Fremen Mirage often either think they're holding those other ideas, especially Ibn Khaldun, or actively hide behind them in bad faith, frequently, but not always, you scratch the surface, what you actually have is that swirl of cyclical history and romantic nationalism, and the poison of the scientific racism it hides. Let me take Ibn Khaldun as an example, and discuss his vision in more depth, because it is actually really quite interesting. Ibn Khaldun, 1332 to 1406, was an Arab writer, born in Tunis, most often known as the father of sociology. Ibn Khaldun wrote a grand universal history, the Kitab al-Ibar, of the world he knew up to his own time. The core concept that creates his cyclical view of history is asabia. As with any translated Arabic word, you will find multiple similar spellings, which means something like solidarity, cohesion, or even clannishness. I like clan cohesion as a way to capture the concept as I understand it, though clan here is not meant in a genetic familial sense, but in a social one. Asabia is the force that holds a group together, particularly under stress, fear, or battle. It is, for Ibn Khaldun, what leads one man to die for another. The reason I don't simply use cohesion, a concept we've met on this blog before, is that Ibn Khaldun only really knows this one kind of cohesion. There are others, which my sense is, from my admittedly limited exposure to him, he does not know about or find relevant. Note, for a lot more depth on this topic, there's actually a really good summary here. I have some serious disagreements with the historical application. For instance, I think the author misunderstands the psychological impact of synchronized discipline on Roman or Han Chinese armies, understanding it as merely force when it is something more. Greer, the author, is a modern strategic writer, and I suspect his training is in political science, which sometimes fails to appreciate the sophistication of ancient social systems. But, as a summary of the ideas, it is quite sound. Asabia has its origins in the clan unit and the kin ties that cause you to defend brother or cousin, but it need not end there. The clan can enlarge itself. And, as Ibn Khaldun notes, a group with very strong asabia, which overtakes another group, can often, almost as if by gravity, attract the members of the defeated group into their own number. Note 
how this necessarily separates Asabia from our romantic Fremen mirage. Asabia need not be tied to ancestry or race. Large, very populous, very diverse societies are unlikely to produce those sorts of strong bonds. Instead, Ibn Khaldun connects Asabia with the clan and the tribe. Generally, smaller, generally more nomadic societies. This produces a cycle in Ibn Khaldun's view. A society with very strong Asabia will be militarily powerful, absorbing less cohesive groups. Often, larger state-based societies, which he perceives, correctly in many cases, as relying on violence and force instead of the soft power of clan cohesion. But that expansion inevitably erodes Asabia in a number of ways. It takes members of the clan out of close contact with each other, so their cohesion withers. It also introduces conquered peoples who must be ruled by force instead of through voluntary cohesion. Non-voluntary Asabia isn't Asabia at all. And the acquisition of large amounts of wealth decouples the interests of individuals with the interests of the group. The new empire fragments as its Asabia weakens, leaving it to be overtaken by the next. Now, as a theory of history, I think this has some explanatory power for a specific subset of states. That sounds like faint praise, but I think Ibn Khaldun's achievement here really is remarkable. It appears to Ibn Khaldun as a general theory because, for six centuries prior to his life, those sorts of states, nomadic peoples who built weakly consolidated empires, was the sort of government that most dominated his region of the world, from the Rashidun Caliphate, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, and so on. But, it is also very much a product of its moment. Ibn Khaldun offers no way out of the cycle of rising and falling Asabia. He cannot imagine a nomadic people successfully managing the transition from a stable group based on Asabia to a stable state based on royal and institutional legitimacy. That is, from one form of power to another form of power, rather than from power to violence to use Hannah Arendt's dichotomy again. For Ibn Khaldun, the state always devolves down to the violence of a king. Ibn Khaldun is entirely correct to note the fragility of violence as a tool of rulership. Arendt will make the same point in 1972, and y'all know how much I love referencing it. What he cannot know is that within 50 years of his death, the Ottomans are going to successfully manage that transition in his own backyard, institutionalizing their control in a durable form. Yes, durable. The Ottoman Empire lasts from 1300 to 1922. It gets tarred as decadent and declining because it was so during the Romantic period discussed above, and so became the symbol of that. But it is Rome's only real peer in the European or Mediterranean in terms of imperial success, which does not rely on clan cohesion, but rather transitions to other forms of manufactured cohesion. The Ottomans, in squaring Ibn Khaldun's circle, point to gaps in his theory, but we may hardly hold him accountable for that, given that he wasn't around to see it happen. The Ottomans aren't a lone case either. I'd argue that the Manchu king, 1644 to 1911, certainly pull off this transition, as do the Mughals, 1526 to 1857, in the modern period. And in antiquity, I'd say that the Achaemenids, 550 to 330, despite the sudden impact of Alexander's superior tactical system, accomplished the same converting a voluntary tribal Asabia system into a successful and stable system based on state legitimacy. Of course, that leaves out all of the major empires which were never Asabia clan systems in the first place. Ibn Khaldun doesn't seem to have a sense that an unclanish state might succeed militarily, because by his day it hasn't happened in his neighborhood in a long time. 
But of course, that's exactly what we see with Rome, which Khaldun does discuss, I should note, in most Chinese dynasties or the colonial empires of the modern period, to name just a few. But why does this feel like a long aside? Unfortunately, because it is. Because, as we've sketched the outlines of the Fremen Mirage, you can see it is actually quite different from Ibn Khaldun's vision. Romantic European thinkers aren't praising the ancient German speakers or Celts for their tight bonds of clan identity, but for their strength, heroic simplicity, and moral, and awkwardly, racial purity. Take a modern example of the trope. Say Conan the Barbarian, and it becomes obvious. He doesn't possess a sabia at all, though he does work with others. His effectiveness comes from ruthless cunning, strength, and skill. Side note, the Fremen are unsophisticated in the mirage, but not stupid. A ruthless trickster's cunning is often part of the package. And the meme doesn't read, close-knit men in a tight clan bond make good times, which make loose-knit tribal bonds that lead to decline. It reads, hard times make hard men. And the Fremen of Dune, as I think, looking at the comments, we're going to need to discuss, don't owe their fierce prowess to Asabia, but to the brutal conditions on Arrakis. Asabia, according to Ibn Khaldun, is more a product of proximity, association, and friendship. It's social. Whereas what the Fremen have is environmental when it isn't genetic. Ibn Khaldun has his own theory of history with its own strengths and shortcomings, but it is not the Fremen mirage. I should also note that Ibn Khaldun was hardly the only Muslim writer who was thinking and writing about the problems of settled peoples encountering nomads, and the clash of different systems of war and society. Also notable are Atamalik al Jawani, 1226-1283, and Ali ibn al-Athir, 1160-1233. What I find striking when brushing up again on Ibn Khaldun is that when his writing does get translated over to the West, in fragments first in 1808, with, as I understand it, the first complete Western translation by William de Slane, finished in 1856, it is translated and contextualized in French through the lens of the self-same assumptions that inform the romantic iteration of the mirage, Orientalism, scientific racism, etc. On this, see A. Hanum, Translation and the Colonial Imagery, Ibn Khaldun, Orientalist. In History and Theory, 42, 2003, 61-81. As Hanum relates, Deslain presents a narrative summary of Ibn Khaldun which primes the reader to understand Ibn Khaldun's work not on its own terms, but as a contest of domination between two races with fixed, innate natures, rather than fluctuating asabia, which degenerate when intermixed a set of concepts quite foreign to Ibn Khaldun's actual writing. In short, Ibn Khaldun wasn't blinded by the Fremen mirage, but his 19th century European translator opted to blind his European readers on his behalf. And that was hardly the only place that these ideas were imported to. As has been mentioned in the comments, the British, particularly after the Indian Mutiny, 1857, were essentially guided by the same kind of thinking to divide India into races, some of which were martial races seen as being genetically fit to serve in the British army, while others were not. The categories drew from scientific racism, imputing that soldierly qualities were essentially genetic, and yet somehow the roster of supposedly martial races did in fact change over time, because of course the idea of martial races of this theory is garbage nonsense. Unless you thought that we were done talking about gender, as Heather Streets shows in Martial Races, the Military, Race, and Masculinity in British Imperial Culture, 1857 to 1914, 2004, the British imported the same gender framing between effeminate Indians unsuited for military service and the manly martial races. 
Conclusions We've been a bit all over the place, so now is a good time to take stock. Last time, we looked at the classical foundation for the Fremen Mirage, a trope of modern pop historical thought. We knew from our first two essays in the series that, apart from a few key possible exceptions, which I promise we will get to, this theory of history didn't really seem to hold up very well. Hard times, it turns out, were a poor substitute for large group sizes, high population density, large resource pools, superior technology, and effective professional training. When we investigated, we found the root of our mirage in a partial form, in the Greek and Roman ethnographic tradition, where it functioned as much, if not more so, as a tool for self-definition, or self-critique, as it did to describe non-state peoples. Since accuracy was never the top concern, this literature needed to be read very critically in order to get anything like actual information on ancient non-state peoples. Side note, is there interest in me talking about what we do know about Gaelic social organization? When that tradition was revived in the early modern period, it was being used in exactly the opposite way the authors originally intended, not as a self-critique of Rome or Greece for Romans or Greeks, but as the basis for forming a national identity out of the legendary past of the non-state people. It was also being read in about the least critical manner conceivable, with the outlandish claims of what was, in essence, Roman propaganda being accepted as complete unvarnished truth. The ambiguity ancient authors expressed about Gauls and Germans, unsophisticated, uneducated, lazy, was misunderstood or ignored to create an idealized past of heroic ancestors which would justify the nationalist project. In the immediate aftermath of the French Revolution, this project went popular, suffusing literature, education, and the arts at exactly the time it fused with a specific strain of European racism informed by half-understood theories of genetics and evolution. Consequently, the hard times that produced the hard men of these ancient societies, and that sense of deprivation and challenge remained crucial to the myth, was offered as proof of genetic racial superiority to justify national aggression in Europe and imperial domination abroad. You can see how the natural selection argument would run, that the difficult environments of cold northern Europe somehow culled the weak and produced the superior stock. With the Fremen mirage coming on the cusp of the new imperialism, Europeans took their different racially charged versions of it abroad, using them as a lens through which they would view other cultures. The German form of this ideology ends up exactly where you think it does, as a core component of Nazi racial ideology, sufficiently dear to the Nazis, as Krebs notes, that in 1943, Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's SS chief, was sending crack SS units into Italy, by this point a war zone where Allied troops were advancing, in a last-ditch effort to try to retrieve what was essentially a holy or unholy text, a manuscript of Tacitus's Germania. Now, I didn't want to lead with that because I wanted to attack this idea dispassionately from a historical angle first, to present that case without first staining the idea by invoking Godwin's law. I wanted to show that this theory of history wasn't sustainable even on its own terms. But this answers our question. If this theory of history isn't terribly accurate or useful, it is, you will note, far less helpful than Ibn Khaldun's concept of Asabia, which is at least really handy when talking about certain sorts of societies. Why does it still maintain currency? The answer is that on top of being in the cultural zeitgeist for a very formative century in world history, this was the sort of historical myth that channeled the vast energies and resources of the new nationalism, and often 
the even vaster resources of the states which sought to harness it. Academics might be funded to push for the inclusion of old national epics into a new canon of great literature, sometimes genuine, Beowulf, The Song of Roland, sometimes not, The Poems of Ossian, into creating huge operas. Der Ring der Nebelungen is 15 hours long. It was funded by the King of Bavaria, Ludwig II, or all pervasive textbooks, or the mountain of artwork and architecture to support new nationalist ideologies. Seriously, stroll almost any European capital, and you will see almost endless examples of romantic nationalist art and architecture. Part of the challenge of writing this post in this series was keeping it short. There is so much artwork, both of heroic Fremen ancestors and decadent Near Easterners. Whole fields of scholarship exist because of this intellectual movement. To be clear, that's not a slight against those fields, many of which are quite aware of that baggage and confront it openly. As the myth at the root of so much modern state building, the resources plowed into propagation were tremendous. Because it is so pervasive, elements of this historical theory, these days, usually with the racist elements at least subdued, lurk in so many unquestioned assumptions and unasked questions. So, why go through all this effort? Well, because knowing where the trap is, that's the first step to evading it. Now, I've seen in the comments some questioning of how much currency the Mirage really maintains, particularly in relation to my metaphor, the Fremen and Dune. Now, I could adduce any number of other examples, Conan the Barbarian, especially his movie form, functionally every depiction of steppe nomads in American cinema, the Dothraki, the Rohitim, and on and on. But I think next week, we're going to divert from our plans slightly and take a closer look at Dune and how it fits within the framework of this romantic version of the Fremen Mirage. You've marched with me through two weeks of intellectual history. Y'all deserve a treat. We're going to head to Dune. But brace yourself. God created Arrakis to train the faithful. It may get rough. Image. Duncan Idaho on Arrakis in Dune. Image description. Let's go with Duncan here and take a closer look at the Fremen, shall we? End of image description. In the meantime, well, quote, The Fremen were supreme in that quality, the ancients called Spannungsbogen, which is the self-imposed delay between desire for a thing and the act of reaching out to grasp that thing. End quote. Dune, 1965, 288. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereaux, recorded by myself, a great divorce for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, Please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.